We know the stories, how Jesus spent days and even weeks wandering from town to town with his disciples. He retreated to isolated places to pray. He considered the birds of the air and the lilies of the field and used them in his teaching. The same spirit who brooded over creation at its beginning also drove Jesus out into the wilderness to be tested and to uh, find some resolve at the beginning of his mission as well. We worship the God in whom all creatures live and move and have their being. So Jesus' spirituality was nurtured by the outdoors as well as being nurtured by the scriptures and the temple. His call to reject wealth, to be content with having enough so that others can have enough as well. His call to, was a call to live sustainably before the word sustainable even existed. Since Jesus, the relationship between the church and Christian theology and a kind of healthy attitude to the rest of life on earth has been ambiguous, but not without promise. Our relationship has been shaped to some extent by the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and what it is that we're doing here, why we're here as human beings. And that can be a little bit tricky because even in the first two chapters of Genesis, we see two quite different ways of understanding humanity and our relationship with the rest of creation and our creator. So in Genesis 1, humanity is presented as being fundamentally separate from the rest of creation and much more like God. As the final ultimate act of creation, humans alone are created in the image and likeness of God. We're then told by divine decree to fill and subdue the earth. We're given dominion over all things. And although this is quickly limited uh, by making us vegetarian, that limitation is removed in Genesis 9 after the flood. And in fact, Genesis 1 and Genesis 9 kind of uh, form the beginning and the end of the same creation story. All things after the flood are given into the hands of Noah and his sons. And we note in passing, not his wife and daughters. Everything is delivered to human beings and from then on all things will live in the fear and dread of us. There's no escaping the violent nature of that word subdue or kabash, which throughout the scriptures refers to the defeat of and the enslavement of enemies. Funnily enough, even though it was written by a beaten and captured people in exile in Babylon, this creation story is the one that has been favoured by rich industrialised Christians with its emphasis on the unique and dominating place of humanity, with the God-given mandate to tread down the rest of creation, which belongs to us, especially to us men, as God's gift. But Mark Brett, uh, amongst others, argues that much of the story's meaning is lost when we read it that way. He argues that Genesis 1 isn't talking about ecology at all. In fact, Genesis 1 is addressing issues of human justice. The point of talking about the image of God and dominion is to undermine the way those terms were being used in Babylon. In the Babylonian religion, only the king was in the image of God and had dominion over all the lands, all the creatures, and indeed all the human beings. He was God's sole representative on earth. So Genesis 1 claims instead that all people are equal, that all share the image of God, and that all should have access to the world's resources. It's about social justice, not ecology. So a Genesis 1 spirituality is an asset in human beings' relationship to each other, and it's quoted a lot in church social justice uh, movements, but it's a stumbling block to our relationship with earth. And in that way, it's kind of the opposite of Genesis 2. Genesis 2 is a much older story, probably starting as an oral tradition. In Australia, it's best read or even acted out around a campfire. It's like a Hebrew dreaming story. And like Aboriginal spirituality in Australia, it emphasises the close connection between humans and the rest of earth. The Adam is created from the Adamah, the Hebrew word for soil. The earthling is created from the earth. Why is the earthling created? Well, not to rule over the earth or subdue it, but in order to abad and shamar it. You'll often see abad translated as till, but much more often in the Bible it's translated as serve. And shamar means protect. So in Genesis 2, earthlings are created to serve and protect God's garden. And it's God's garden, not ours. Humans are still special. It's only into Adam that God specifically breathed the breath of life. And of course, we're given a special role, being the servant and protector of the garden. And that implies both humility in being a servant and ability that we can do it. It resonates a lot better, I reckon, with Jesus' call to servant leadership that we read in Mark. 
So in Genesis 1 and Genesis 9, earth and its creatures are given to us. But in Genesis 2, humanity is given to God's garden. Unfortunately, although Genesis 2 gives this wonderfully rich ecological understanding of the relationship between humans and other animals, Genesis 3 gives a terrible explanation of why it hasn't worked out very well, driving a wedge between women and the men who value their relationships, because from now on, men are going to rule over women. Genesis 2, which started with such ecological promise, ends with nothing but bad news for women and the men who value their companionship. So Genesis 1 has a kind of terrible ecology, but great human equality, until you get to Genesis 9. And Genesis 2 and 3 has great ecology, but terrible human equality. As Christians, we have to learn from our Christian tradition, obviously, and the teachings of Jesus, but also from the creation stories that are coming to us through the sciences, like cosmology and geology, genetics and evolution. The Uniting Church in particular commits itself to that in its basis of union. We need to remember, of course, that many of the pioneers in these scientific disciplines were Christians themselves and even ministers and priests. There's so much to say about this, but in the minute and a half that I have, I'll just share one thought with you. I'd like to adapt Jesus' story of the prodigal son with our new understanding that we are now, through our genetic relationships and ecologically, part of one earth family. God's family includes all creatures. So what does it mean to be a prodigal of the earth family? Consider just one Australian example of what an ecological prodigal might look like. This is from 1869 in the height of the timber cutting era. The devastation, the devastating acts of the timber getters has made dire havoc among the cedar brushes and where a few years ago immense quantities of wood could be found, there is not now a single tree worth cutting. The sawers are a most wasteful set of men. They spoil more timber than they use. They cut and square only the very best parts of a tree leaving great masses of cedar to rot unheeded in the brushes. Now, for a while since then, logging came to its senses, and particularly as the bigger trees started to disappear, and we started moving towards sustainable harvesting of timber. But that, unfortunately, has been rapidly undone at the moment by the industrialisation of the timber industry and recent government regulations. In contrast to that kind of attitude stands the elder brother in the story the oldest inhabitant, who for us would be the Aboriginal Australians. Now, while their impact on the ecology of Australia was significant and uh, much greater than appreciated until recently, those groups that survived until white Australians were the descendants of those who, like the older brother, had lived within the family's means, as part of the family. Many Aboriginal Christians retain this spirituality of connection, of belonging to Mother Earth, of part of the family. And the Uniting Church in Australia, at least, is committed to having its spirituality shaped and influenced by the First Peoples' wisdom and their unique insights into God's ways in Australia. Now, of course, the ecological version of the prodigal son story has one key difference from Jesus' version. The ecological prodigal didn't simply leave the family, waste their resources and end up in the pig pen. Through technology... He ran out of assets, but continued to take more and more from elder brothers all around the world. No matter how frugally and wisely the ecological elder brothers lived, their homes continued to be plundered. So it's not possible for God and the elder brother to simply wait for the prodigals to come to their senses and return home, or all will be lost. As long as the ecological prodigals can maintain their lifestyle by creating new pig pens around the world, they will. The elder brothers, and those prodigals who have returned home already, can't be limited to the resentful passivity of the elder brother in Jesus' story. They need the table-turning, whip-cracking spirituality of Jesus to be added into the mix. Jesus spent time in the wild lands, for sure, but he also uh, didn't stay there. He returned to the seat of power and challenged it, confronted what was going on. He didn't just tell stories or preach. He walked into the temple courtyard, kicking over the tables of those who were exploiting the system and interfering with people's ability to love God and each other in communal worship. Whether we think being human is to rule creation in God's stead, like Genesis 1, or to serve it on God's behalf, like Genesis 2, or to return humbly to live well with the earth family, it's going to require more than prayers and pronouncements when the powerful prevaricate and politicise things in order to hang on to their power. Jesus' table turning, of course, led straight to his crucifixion. But if you believe in resurrection, you can be brave like he was. 
as we sit down to count the cost of our next steps in building a better world, we might ask, well, not can we, what can we do? But the much more confronting question, the cross-bearing question, what are we not willing to give up to live well on the earth and to make sure that everyone else can as well?